I've been asked to give a sort of uh, bird's eye overview, if you like, of what the uh, African states and regional organizations have been doing on the continent. And I'm going to focus on the period since the early 21st century, really since the new African Union was created in the early 2000s, and give you my sense of uh, what have they been doing. And the short answer to that question is that the last 15, 16 years or so have been spent trying to build a thing called the APSA, the African Peace and Security Architecture. And I don't know how many of you are sort of new to the acronym soup of things to do with the African Peace and Security Architecture, but I'm going to try and give you a quick rundown of basically what I think has been going on, um, how far they've got with trying to complete that, and then we should say it's not finished yet. This is still ongoing project. And then the majority of my time, I want to spend looking at some of the ongoing challenges that Africa's organizations and states have got to building this architecture, and I've listed eight um, that I'll go through. But that's the, the plan of attack, basically, and uh, hopefully that will stimulate some questions and, and issues. So just a, a few words on context, first of all, in terms of what's happening. So I said the simple way to think about what's been happening is 54 slash 55 countries have got together with a whole lot of help from their external friends and partners, ourselves included, and they've tried to build a new set of security institutions that can meet the challenges facing the continent in the 21st century. And it's still work in progress, as I've said. So that's the key point. Everything that I'm going to talk about subsequently that African organizations have done, they've done without actually finishing the toolbox of instruments that they've been trying to build to do a thing called conflict management. So I'm going to get very depressing, basically, over the next 20 minutes. Yeah. So I'm going to start with this positive note. But everything you're going to, and I'm going to talk about now subsequently, we should remember, has been done without the APSA institutions being completed. So this is a, a sort of good point, good news story to, to, um, to start with. Secondly, what's the sort of military and political context in which this has been happening? Well, basically, the 21st century in Africa has been one of major organized violence, conflict, and, and crises of every sort under the sun. So as a result of this, we've seen more peace operations deployed on the continent than anywhere else on the planet anywhere before. Just in the 21st century alone, we've had over 50 different peace operations deployed in Africa now, which, again, is yeah, interesting for people like me who study them, but it's obviously a terrible indicator of how many crises we've actually had to deal with. As a result of that, we've also seen now record numbers of peacekeepers deployed on the continent. We've got at any given time for the last decade at least 100,000 plus United Nations peacekeepers. But at any given time, we've had up to nearly 30,000 uh, African-led uh, peacekeeping forces as well in different parts of the, um, of the continent. We've also seen the addition, importantly now, of police. So one of the big changes that we've seen over that last 15, 16 year period is that more and more of our peacekeepers are police officers now rather than just soldiers. And that's presenting both a, a series of opportunities but also a series of challenges uh, moving forward. The fourth point to think about for context is what I call partnership peacekeeping. Most of our attempts, in fact I would say all of our attempts at crisis management now, um, at least in the peace and security realm in Africa, they're all examples of what I would call partnership peace operations. And what I mean by that is just at least two or more organizations or states are involved. Nobody does it alone. There's not a single organization that can cope with the whole sort of range of challenges and issues on the African continent, and nor should it at one level. So we see a whole lot of collaborative partnerships developing at a multilateral level between the United Nations, the European Union, the African Union, the regional economic communities, and then a whole lot of bilateral partnerships of one sort or another, the United States, UK, France, etc. But partnership is the norm. And I think it's, it's almost inconceivable now that that's going to change anytime soon. Um, the African Union, as I'll explain, still requires a lot of help in terms of capacity building and capabilities from its friends and partners. Fifth point of context, briefly then, is just to say, although I am going to get more depressing, um, after a long period of good news when it comes to conflict and organized violence, from 1990-ish until about 2010, we saw actually pretty much every indicator of organized violence dropping on the continent, right? This was generally a good news set of stories. From 2010 onwards, however, the last seven years now, or six and a half years, have seen quite a dramatic upswing again. So things are getting worse and have done so quite rapidly in the last six years. But for just a point of context or history, 
we're still nowhere near as bad as we were, say, in the late 1990s on the continent. So although things have been getting worse in the last six years or so, we're still nowhere near the levels of organized violence and battle deaths and other things that we saw in Africa in the, the 1990s. Final point, um, by way of context, then, is just when I'm going to talk about the APSA and the African Union, from now on, I'm going to sort of imply that they speak with one voice. Yeah, and I'm sure even depending how many years you've worked on this continent, you know, the phrase African solutions to African problems, etc., which I think is analytically just nonsense, right? It's not useful, it's not helpful at all, but as a political slogan, we can understand why people do it. The AU is not speaking with a homogenous monolithic voice on most issues. The AU is basically a political arena, and I mean that in like a gladiatorial sense of an arena, yeah, where ideas and policies and values basically go to fight one another. But the majority of that debate is between African states and organizations. And so what comes out of the other end, as I'll explain, um, may have the look of sort of, um, let's say, coherence and, and homogeneity at some level. But the AU is clearly divided still on a whole lot of issues that are important for us to remember. And I, as I'll talk about a bit later, you know, the caricatured version is at one end of the spectrum, you've got the sort of Ghana's, Senegal, Tanzania's of, of the continent, basically consolidated democracies pushing a largely liberal good governance agenda. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the sort of equatorial guineas, the Sudans, the Swazilands, etc., that are pushing very different types of political um, ways forward. So that's the context. The chart there, just to say a quick word, is just showing, if you look at the post-Cold War period, this is who deploys into UN peacekeeping operations divided up by continent. And the point I want to stress here is the blue line that you see of Africa. African states are just taking more and more responsibility for their own conflict management over time. And now African states are providing the most police and troops of any other continent um, to do UN peacekeeping. And that's important to remember because that wouldn't have happened or even been thinkable, I would have said, 20 years ago. And the reason why that's important is that organizations, partly like the US, say the Global Peace Operations Initiative or ACOTA or the British Peacekeeping Training Programs or the French Recamp Program and others, there's been a whole lot of effort put into making African states um, basically more capable when it comes to doing peacekeeping types of tasks. And it's largely been a success story at one level. And so I want to flag that up at the beginning. The other point of context which leads to that is on top of everything that African states have been doing in UN peacekeeping operations, they've also, as I put up here now, done over a dozen different peace operations of their own. These are the ones that have just been authorized or led by the African Union. And as I said, I'm going to get more depressing as I go on, so I want to start with the, the good news, is that I'm going to look at a lot of challenges as to why there are still a lot of problems with conflict management on the continent. But while I'm saying that, we've got to remember there's actually been a huge leap forward as well. If you compare the African Union to the old OAU, the Organization of African Unity, there's just been a complete sea change in both the aspiration, the tempo of operations, and the capabilities. And you'll see up here this list over a dozen missions, about 70,000 peacekeepers deployed at various times. And as you can see from the mandates on the, the right-hand side, these range from sort of tiny little observer monitoring missions right the way through the spectrum of peacekeeping to peace building, civilian protection, stabilization and enforcement missions, and even basically at the Somalia end, war fighting, um, Amasom against Al-Shabaab or the MNJTF against Boko Haram. So I'm going to go back and explain now in a bit more detail you know, how this has come about really and what African organizations have been trying to do. So the way I thought I would do this is just run through what I would consider to be sort of eight big challenges that are still being faced by the organizations that are trying to build this peace and security architecture. And the first big challenge is what I'm going to call strategic coordination. There is a lot of moving parts in this peace and security architecture. And so when I talk about the APSA, this is what I mean. It's this little bundle of institutions there. I don't know, again, how much you have worked on this stuff already or don't know. Are you familiar with these institutions or not? If, you, if you're not, can you stick a hand up? Okay, let's assume we're not then, right? Okay. So the APSA, in its sort of um, simplest form, is a bunch of institutions that are meant to deal with the whole spectrum of conflict management issues. So by that I mean everything from preventative diplomacy and conflict prevention at one end through to mediation and negotiation, through peacekeeping, peace building, 
post-war reconstruction and then even post um, um, sort of transitional justice mechanisms, the whole panoply of conflict management um, initiatives. In the heart of this is the PSC, the Peace and Security Council. This is the African version of the UN Security Council. It's 15 member states that take all the key decisions on peace and security issues. And that's like the, the cockpit or the driving seat for this um, set of institutions. Around them, I'll just mention very quickly, I mean, you can read them yourself, but there's a legal document, the Common African Defense and Security Policy, which sets out basically what are our aspirations of working together as 54 or now 55 African states in the area of peace and security. You've then got the, the other one in dark green, the African Standby Force, which I'll talk about more in a minute. This is their way of getting about 25,000 troops and police ready to deploy in the crisis response mode. The other things you've got up there, the MSC, the Military Staff Committee. This is like the Military Staff Committee at the UN. It's meant to be basically senior military officers feeding military advice into the Peace and Security Council to make its decisions. The Qs, the Continental Early Warning System, I hope speaks for itself, yeah? This is the institution that is supposed to do the preventative risk analysis, early warning, what's coming over the horizon type of um, issues. The uh, POWs, Prisoner of War, sorry, Panel of the Wise. Um, I normally say, you know, you wouldn't want to set up a panel of the idiots, right? Um, the Panel of the Wise is sometimes indistinguishable from a, pa no. It, the, the Panel of the Wise is basically five elderly um, states people in Africa. And by elderly, I mean like really elderly. The first, the average age of the first lot was about late 70s, early 80s. But the idea was that you would have these elder states people who had long careers in peace and security on the continent, and they were supposed to do the sort of blue skies thinking, what were the issues that were going to be coming over the horizon that we should sort of start thinking about now? They don't do much in practice, but I'm happy to talk if you want. And then finally, the uh, peace fund, the money. Who was going to pay for all these things? And that's another challenge I'm going to talk about later. So bundle those institutions together. That's what we mean when we talk about the APSA, the peace and security architecture. It's all those bits working together. But as I said, the challenge is coordination because those institutions on their own, I exaggerate only slightly when I say they can't actually do much on their own. They certainly can't deploy peace operations on their own. So they need help from various other actors. They need bureaucratic support from the African Union Commission. These are the roughly 1,000 civil servants here yeah, that work mainly in Addis Ababa at the African Union, but provide the bureaucratic civil service support for things. They also need help from the RECs, the regional economic communities. There are eight of those that the AU works with, I'll talk about in a minute. And then also two what are called regional mechanisms. These are particular bits of the African standby force in East Africa and North Africa. Because after all, if you want to deploy a peace operation, the AU doesn't have its own army. It has to devolve these things to regional standby forces. But it's also more complicated than that because who actually has soldiers and police and civilian experts at the end of the day? It's the member states, not the regional organizations that own these things. So I put all those in green because all those moving parts are supposed to be on the same team, supposed to be in the same organization and working together. But it's more complicated than that because when you actually need to do anything, like planning for a peace operation or logistics support or other types of things, the UN actually provides major support systems and roles in almost every one of these crisis response missions. It's more complicated than that though even because uh, money is a big issue as I'll talk about and the European Union now has spent nearly 2 billion euros since 2004 on boosting these African um, institutions because they haven't paid for them themselves. And it's even more complicated than that because they've then got all the bilateral partners like ourselves. As you can tell from my accent, right, I have real mixed identity issues when it comes to US and UK. So I don't know when to say I and we and us and them. But America, France, it pains me to say, is much more important than the UK these days on the, the continent. But you get the picture, yeah? Various forms of bilateral support here. Now, my um, engineeringly sort of suspect series of cogs here um, is to make that overall point about strategic coordination. For the African organizations to deploy anything like a peace operation to Somalia or Mali or whatever, you need to coordinate amongst this huge array of different actors. And so at one level, it's amazing the AU has done anything. 
And I say that like literally, it's amazing if you have to get the EU, the UN, the AU, it's amazing anything happens. And as some bright spark pointed out to me a little while ago, these cogs don't actually work um, as a machine. But I thought that just makes my point even more. Um, the point is, it's very difficult to coordinate, and that's key challenge number one. How do we do it? Key challenge number two, then, is to focus just on those regional economic communities that I've just mentioned. And there's eight of those that the African Union has a, um, a sort of a formal relationship with in the realm of peace and security. In 2008, after having a lot of debates for years about who should really lead on these different issues, right? So if there's a crisis in uh, northeastern Nigeria or the north of Mali or Somalia, there's a debate within Africa about who should take the lead political voice. Should it be the continent, and hence the African Union based in Addis, or should it devolve to the regional player concerned, ECOWAS or EGAD or, or whoever? So to try and sort of come up with some clarity on the answer to that question, in 2008, the African Union signed a memor memorandum of understanding with these different regional organizations to try and solve uh, that particular puzzle. And the one word answer to the, the puzzle, if you like, was the word subsidiarity. They said we should follow the pro principle of subsidiarity when making our decisions about crisis response. And so subsidiarity, I hope you all you know, basically that local solutions to local problems are where we should start. And you should only involve sort of higher levels of organization and government to the extent that the local level fails. The trouble, of course, with subsidiarity is that actually that doesn't clear up in practice who should lead on any given crisis. And so since this MOU was signed, we still have a lot of arguments about who should lead on a particular crisis. Should it be the REC concerned or the African Union? In pretty much every case you look at, whether it's you know, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Somalia, etc., there's often differences of opinion between the African Union and the regional economic community concerned. Now, since 2008 and the MOU, various mechanisms have been put in place to try and ensure that the RECs and the Union are on the same page. It's working better than it used to, but it doesn't work perfectly. So I'm going to say that's sort of challenge number two, is to get that relationship right. Challenge number three is specifically related to the African standby force. And the African standby force, again, who, I don't know, in, who of you have already encountered the ASF, African standby force, and know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. Um, this is imparting knowledge then, yeah? I think that's what it's called. Uh, the African standby force then is designed basically in 2003 by setting up what the AU called a roadmap. And in 2003, it set up a roadmap for how was Africa as a continent going to respond to a particular crisis on the continent. And the way they said is that we're going to use the regional, um, the sub-regions of Africa as the building blocks for this continental peacekeeping force. And so the AU doesn't have its own army or police force, as I said before, so we would devolve responsibility down to the regional, sub-regional level. And they said each sub-region, each of the five sub-regions, should come up with basically a brigade's worth of troops. So we're looking at about four and a half to 5,000 soldiers in each of the five sub-regions. And then, um, has anyone seen Transformers, you know, the movies? <laughs> Don't, they're awful, I wouldn't recommend it. But you know the Optimus Prime idea, the idea that the Transformers would come together and basically fit together to build this overarching super transformer Optimus Prime, yeah? That was basically the same theory of the African standby force initially. It was that these five regional brigades of roughly four and a half to 5,000 troops would be able to basically come together, be interoperable, and hence be able to deploy a peacekeeping force of up to about 20,000 troops. Because if you know, you know, normally what we would call a big peacekeeping operation in a Congo, Darfur, etc., we're talking low 20,000 or so. So the idea was that the standby force, when it was fully assembled, would be the equivalent of one big UN peacekeeping operation. The long story we've seen since 2003 is basically that that aspiration has never been reached or implemented in practice. And that instead, the five sub-regions have basically gone their own way in terms of setting up their own regional standby forces. And they've developed at very sort of uneven and different speeds. Which gets to the challenge that I put up here. Um, African standby force getting to FOC, full operational capability. 
We're certainly not there yet, even though we started building this thing in 2003. The initial plan was that the ASF would be completed in 2010. So, yeah, we're a little bit behind schedule, but don't let that deter you. Um, how were each of these um, forces meant to operate? Initially, they were supposed to be military brigades, and they were called regional standby brigades. And then in about 2005, we changed the terminology to regional forces because they were no longer solely military, but they also included police and civilian elements as well. So we're now talking about multidimensional regional forces. Um, I can get into the why I've shaded some countries on the map and others aren't, but basically let's just stick with that at the beginning as those five regional forces. At the end of 2015, after say 12 years of trying to basically build this thing, there was the second major training um, operation and cycle, Amani II in Africa. And it was at that point that the AU declared four of the regions operational. The one region that wasn't operational, basically not at all, is the North African region for obvious reasons. Yeah, They have not got anything like a working regional standby force. But even the four that were declared operational, it means very different things in each region because they're still at quite different levels of development. But I should say, just at the beginning, I say if you haven't studied this before, although it's called a standby force, there are no forces standing by in Africa waiting to deploy at like 48 hours notice or whatever. So it's a misnomer in that sense. What full operational capability means for the ASF is that these countries in each of the subregions have pledged capabilities. So they're bits of paper where they pledge like one infantry battalion, one form police unit, some civilian experts, etc. And they pledge that when the Peace and Security Council makes the political decision and authorizes the deployment, we would actually live up to those pledges and then we would start assembling our troops on the basis of that, which is why I put the triangles up there about the planning elements in each of the different um, regional forces. But don't think when you hear African standby force, don't think of like a big barrack somewhere with like 4,000 troops ready to go, right? That is not what this is about. It's about paper and political pledges and then assembling those missions after they've been authorized by the Peace and Security Council. I could go on for days, right, about the challenges still facing the different regions here. But suffice it to say, in military terms, they're still uh, three out of ten, this sort of thing, right? If, if you're thinking logistics, enablers, field hospitals, aviation, right, they are better than they used to be, but they are not in any way, shape or form ready to go on their own and sustain themselves anytime soon. So challenge four, the money. Obviously, this was going to cost money. Luckily for the Africans, um, it's cost somebody else's money, right? That's the short version of this challenge. So the shortest way I can put the financial challenge is Africa still lacks what I put up there, sustainable, predictable, and flexible financing for all its conflict management activities. I'm not going to bore you with the AU budget, and in fact, I don't know the intricacies of the AU budget, but basically, if you look at the green little um, pie chart at the top right-hand corner there, the way we need to think about the African Union's budget when it comes to peace and security issues is there are basically three types of things we spend money on. The operating budget, basically just you know, the salaries, the operating costs of our civil servants in the African Union Commission, going places, you know, just doing their daily jobs. Then program budget costs, right? If we want to go on conferences, run actual programs and do programmatic activity, that's the second bit. Those two bits put together are what the African Union classifies as its formal budget. And so in fiscal year 2016, those two dark green bits come to just over $400 million a year. Right, so in the bigger world of military and peace and security spending, this is not a large budget, but the AU's programmatic and operating costs about $415 million a year. Then the other bit, though, is when you do a peace operation, and we've done, as I showed you, like over 12 of those now, that's completely separate. And that's what the African Peace Fund was supposed to be for, right? The Peace Fund was supposed to be where African states would put their money into, like the United Nations, and have a financial mechanism to pay for peace operations. Now, to give you an idea there, Amisom at the moment in Somalia costs roughly, roughly, 1 billion US dollars a year to run. 
And so in some years, 2013, for example, when the AU had missions in Mali, Somalia, against the Lord's Resistance Army and a bunch of other places, we were probably looking at you know, $1.6, $1.7 billion that year to run these things. So that's the, the budget when I talk about it. So the challenge is who pays for that? And the short version is um, not Africans. In terms of percentages, the dark green bits on the pie chart, about 75% of that is paid for by foreigners. The European Union, ourselves, NATO countries and others, right? So about three quarters of the operating and program costs are paid for by foreigners. When it comes to the peace operations budget, it's over 90% is paid by foreigners. Some years it's as low as 91% and some years it's as high as 96. But that's how the money breaks down, yeah? So a huge challenge for the last 15 years has been, well, okay, um, if foreigners are basically funding all this stuff, what does this tell us? And it's raised big questions, I think, about basically the credibility of these institutions certainly about local ownership. You don't own anything really if you're not paying the bills, right? Whoever's paying the bills gets quite a large say on what happens. And it also raises big questions about sustainability. What if the donors and partners that are paying these things suddenly stop paying these things? You know, last I heard, the EU was having a serious debate about precisely this issue. Rumor has it there's a new administration in town here that is debating these issues yet. So, what would happen to all these institutions if they're 90% and 75% paid by foreigners? We shall see. Along then comes, in 2015, the solution. In 2015, the African Union says, we aspire to pay 100% of our operating costs, 75% of our program costs, and one quarter of our peace operations budget by 2020. I'll say that again, right? The aspiration is that by 2020, the AU will pay its own salaries for its own civil servants. It will pay three quarters of their programmatic budget when they go on conferences and do other programs, three quarters of that by 2020. And they will pay one quarter of the peace operations bill, which as I said, Amazon on its own is about a billion dollars a year. So that's the aspiration. How to get there, Donald Kabaruka, who was the former Rwandan finance minister and former head of the Africa Development Bank, a year and a half ago, he was made the champion, as they called it, basically of the African Peace Fund. It was his job to come up with an idea of how to fund this stuff with actually indigenous sources of finance, so African financial solutions to African problems, if you like. He looked at the things that I put in the bottom right-hand pie chart, basically. Um, it's a bit small, but... Uh, Levies. So previously when people had looked at this, they said, I know one way we could pay for all this stuff is we tax foreigners who stay in hotels in Africa. And we just put a levy on every foreigner that comes in and basically stays in hotel accommodation in Africa, 2%, that'll help. Or we do the same thing on flights, international flights into the continent. We just take a percentage of that and put it in the peace fund. Or the most radical one, because this would get really tricky, but actually generate a lot of money. We could tax some um, text messaging on the continent. Now all of those, basically, there was long discussions, they all got ditched, and what um, Kabaruka ended up with was a, a levy on uh, basically what they're calling eligible imports into the continent of 0.2%. And so the theory here would be that as the African economies grow, generally, yeah, 0.2% starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we put that into the peace fund to pay for these different things. We are still currently debating how to implement that, and I'm happy to chat more if you want. Uh, challenge five. I'll speed up a bit here, but if you're new to this, there's just a lot of different information. Challenge five is about the depressing thought. Um, what if we've spent 17 years trying to build all these institutional frameworks and organizational mechanisms and then when a real crisis comes along, they don't match or they don't fit. And that's quite a depressing thought because it seems to happen all the time. Our real crises basically don't mesh on to the things that we're trying to build. And that's part for the reason I mentioned before, yeah? The, um, they're not really standby forces, right? These are pledges that take a long time to kick in. But the point here would be that real crises don't actually mesh on to real 
Rec framework. So if you think, for example, when we had the, the sort of Tuareg rebellions in Mali, northern Mali, and then the jihadists from AQIM, Ansar Dean, and others latched onto these, once we had that big crisis in Mali, ECOWAS is sort of the lead, obvious lead choice here, going to back to that debate about subsidiarity. But you can't deal with the issues in Mali without getting basically Algeria, Libya, and probably a few others involved. So ECOWAS alone can't deal with this. Or if you think about the Boko Haram problem, same issue. You know, the majority of the issue here is northeastern Nigeria, but then it brings in the countries around the Lake Chad Basin as well. And so you get, again, out of ECOWAS. So the fit between real crises that have happened on the continent and our actual regional frameworks don't seem to align very often. Which means we've got a problem between the way we envisage this architecture and the real problems and threats we're coming up against, which is our sixth challenge. Specifically, the standby force that I've talked about before, when it was uh, originally envisaged in 2003, the first roadmap said there were six scenarios that the African standby force might deploy into. And that's what we were going to use this um, set of soldiers and police for. And the six scenarios you see on the right-hand side there, they basically go through the spectrum of how would we respond to basically a pretty traditional civil war type of scenario? And it runs through from sort of very small monitoring and observation missions through to sort of traditional peacekeeping, then multidimensional peacekeeping. And then scenario six at the end was about basically humanitarian intervention. What should we do in response to basically crimes against humanity, mass atrocities, genocide and the like? But that's how we envisage the African standby force being used. It was a, I think, a pretty traditional notion of civil war, political armed conflict was at the heart of this, and we would try and respond accordingly. The assumption, at least in scenarios one to five, is that the end game would be some type of political agreement, maybe bringing together like a transitional government of national unity, you know, some power sharing arrangement, and the troops and police would facilitate the implementation of that deal. And then, what do we get? We get real life and real wars on the continent, and we get enemies like Al-Shabaab, and AQIM, and Ansar Dean, and Boko Haram, and the M23, and the FDLR. And all of a sudden, um, you know what? We don't want to have peace deals with these organizations. Uh, we're not going to try and have a government of national unity with the FDLR, or AQIM, or Al-Shabaab. So all of the frameworks we were sort of thinking about for deployment didn't really seem to fit these more sort of enforcement war fighting scenarios. So since then, more recently, we're having a debate within the African Union about, well, okay, how do we think more broadly? If we were going to design the template now in 2017, not 2003, what would it look like? And that's where you get these other challenges that are appearing front and center. This standby force, you know, the troops, the police, and the civilian experts, what role should they play in responding to transnational terror networks like your Al-Shababs and others? What role, if any, should they play in relation to environmental types of security challenges? What role should they play in relation to transnational organized criminal networks, some of whom yeah, are very tightly woven with insurgent groups, others are more sort of standalone? Maritime security issues, right? there's no mention. The whole, pretty much the whole of the ASF was land-based with a little bit of aviation Maritime issues were just non-existent there, so how do we think about all these things? Pandemics. Um, Ebola is obviously the one that stands out most importantly recently. Ebola was the first time that the African Union deployed what I call like a health-keeping mission rather than a peacekeeping mission. Yeah? We deployed health workers to stem that pandemic. So we have to re-envision the whole of the framework. That's challenge six. Challenge seven, I think I'm going to... I think I'm going to skip... Given, if you haven't heard of the ASF, right, you're not going to have heard of the ACERC, and we can get into these issues in a bit more detail, but just, I suppose, a very quick version. Africans themselves, in particular after the crisis in Mali, how would I put it? They were a bit embarrassed that the French military had to lead the way in Mali in early 2012. And ECOWAS in particular in West Africa, I think, you know, was politically embarrassed that they could not deploy their own forces when they passed their own resolutions and communiques to say, we want to stem this threat that's coming down to Bamako from the north, they couldn't do it except on the back of a French unilateral operation. That stimulates a debate 
in Africa itself, which is just really the one I've just explained to you, that said, hold on, we spent all this time building these regional standby forces, and then we can't deploy them, and we don't need ECOWAS, we need ECOWAS Plus, should we think of a different model? And so the different model that was proposed was this thing called the ACERC, the African Capacity for Immediate Response to Crises, which in a very sort of short and caricatured form was basically a coalition of the willing model instead of regional standby forces. So the ACERT model basically said you take a framework or lead nation, you configure the coalition of the willing around whatever that problem is, and you draw that coalition of the willing, not just from the sub-regional rec, but you can draw that coalition from anywhere on the continent, right? Whoever wants to sign up. About 16 countries signed up for this ACERC model. ACERC, however, has never deployed in practice either. So it's still largely theoretical, but it basically caused a big fight within the African Union about which model should we support, the African Standby Force Regional Arrangements Framework or this ACERC Coalition of the Willing. It caused a problem for partners like us because who do you now give your money to? you basically piss off the other side, depending who you gave the cash. So it, it came sort of politically awkward for us. Suffice it to say, I'll leave it there right for now, but that's also been a part of the debate as to where we are. And finally, to finish then, um, the politics of all this. As I said, the short version of my talk is that we've spent 15 years trying to build this thing called the peace and security architecture. We're still not finished yet. But the overriding conclusion, sadly, is that none of those missions I put up, the 12 or so peace operations from before, none of those have actually been an official ASF deployment. There's not still been a single case where any one of these regional forces has actually deployed. All of those missions have basically been coalitions of one sort or another cobbled together. So a big question remains, you know, do we even actually have the political will to use this toolbox that we've just spent a decade and a half trying to build. The closest we've got more recently was the debate about Burundi in late 2015, early 2016, where the Eastern African standby force was put on contingency mode and it basically did a whole lot of contingency planning as if they were going to deploy in Burundi. And then there was the political decision was basically cancelled. Politics at the AU meant we were not going to deploy that sub-regional force. And part of the issue that this raises here is that until African leaders start thinking multilaterally in their responses, it's hard to envisage these multilateral institutions actually being used for um, deployment. Uh, as I said, the sort of equatorial guineas, Sudan, Zimbabwe's, etc., they think more unilaterally first in their foreign policies and multilaterally, I would say, a distant um, second. So put all those eight challenges together, yeah? There's a huge set of problems still facing this peace and security architecture. But, to not get too depressing, I said, it's way, way better than we had 15 years ago with the old organization of African unity. But we've got a little bit of, uh, yeah, 15 years of teething issues, I think. So I'll stop there. I know that was a bit longer. but.